Yeah, so thank you very much for the uh, invitation. It's uh, great to be here, and um, I look forward uh, to the discussion with uh, you. So I'm going to talk about free will in a physical world. So let's begin with a question of what is free will, um, and we'll take a simple starting point. Um, very roughly speaking, free will is the ability to choose or control our own actions. Obviously, we'll want to make this a little bit more precise as we um, go along. But just to uh, get the intuitions uh, on the table straight away, um, it was presumably your free choice to come to this lecture. Um, I take it that um, uh, most of you uh, will agree with this, uh, with this statement, uh, and you know, let's hope that you weren't coerced to come to this lecture. Um, and likewise, if you have time, la uh, time later tonight, it'll be your free choice uh, whether you want to tune into the radio or television and listen to the news uh, to you know, hear about the latest uh, crazy populist developments in the world or, or not. So once again, I, um, I take it that's going to be your free choice. Or when I had breakfast this morning, <clears throat> I was able to freely choose between coffee and tea and some other options. Um, so there was uh, uh, clearly no sense in which one of those choices was uh, necessitated beforehand, or so we normally tend to think. I mean, I might, of course, have a preference for one kind of drink over another, but that is not to say that I couldn't also have chosen uh, the other one. And uh, I think it's fair to say that free will is central to our practices of responsibility attribution and also to our self-conception as agents who deliberate about uh, what to do um, and um, it's free, uh, free will is usually considered to be a necessary condition for responsibility. I mean, maybe free will is not quite sufficient for responsibility because a bunch of other requirements need to be in place as well, but um, <clears throat> many people would want to say that we can't be held responsible for actions that we did not freely choose. And by the way, the examples that I've given here are all fairly trivial choices, but we make much bigger choices. Uh, all the time or so we think choices between, let's say, different universities in which to enroll for studying, the choices between perhaps different ca career plans, uh, the choice whether to marry someone or not. I mean, we make uh, major choices and the standard assumption is that um, our free will um, is um, involved in those choices and in addition, um, what makes us responsible agents uh, is precisely that we uh, freely made those choices. <clears throat> okay, so what is the challenge? Well, it's not clear um, how free will fits into a naturalistic worldview, that is to say, a worldview based on the sciences, especially the physical sciences, and there are by now many different uh, broadly naturalistic challenges for free will. Um, in fact, if you look at uh, some of the popular science literature now, um, you pick up um, you know, any issue of Scientific American or New Scientist or you know, similar magazines which exist all over the world, um, the chances are that you'll come across an article saying something like free will is an illusion or science, neuroscience shows that there is no such thing as free will. I'm sure you will all have seen this. If you go to the nearest bookshop, you browse in the popular science section, no doubt you're, you're going to come across some books that uh, claim to show just this. So um, what I want to do is develop a strategy for defending free will against these challenges. And in fact, um, I've been working on this strategy for a while. I've, I've just completed a book manuscript setting out uh, a defense of free will more broadly. Um, uh, and uh, my plan today is to give you um, a bit of an overview of um, what I take the challenge to be and uh, what some of the ingredients uh, in uh, hopefully a plausible response are. So let me first describe the challenge a little bit more precisely. <clears throat> and I'll pr present a challenge scheme. There are different instances of it. So on this um, naturalistic uh, challenge scheme, um, the argument usually goes like this. Um, free will requires some property P, where P might be one or several of the following intentional goal-directed agency. I think we can probably all agree that um, you can't have free will unless you're an intentional goal-directed agent. If we look at this uh, chair uh, here, for instance, that's not an intentional goal-directed agent, and indeed, um, it's not the sort of entity that, that has free will. Um, 
Secondly, the ability to choose among different courses of action. Again, we take that to be a key uh, condition for, for free will. Many of us would want to say um, that unless we have the ability to choose between different actions, we, we lack free will. And then thirdly, um, there's the requirement of causation of our actions by our mental states, especially by our intentions. Um, again, unless our actions are somehow under our causal control, it's not clear how they can be said to be free. I mean, if our intentions were just some kind of epiphenomenon or byproduct of physical processes, but it is always the brain that causes us to do one thing rather than another, that uh, is, not, is not good enough for free will. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, take this as given for the moment. Free will requires intentional agency, alternative possibilities to choose from, and um, causal control over our actions. But then it is claimed, so that's how the challenge goes, it is claimed that science shows that there is no such thing as property P, you know, whichever one of these uh, three things it, it might be. Specifically, the claim is that P is not to be found among the fundamental physical features of the world. You know, perhaps um, this proper, any of these properties are just convenient fictions of our pre-scientific way of thinking. Or maybe the idea that we are intentional agents is just a, a leftover from a pre-scientific, folk psychological way of thinking about human behavior. Um, likewise, the idea that we can make genuine choices between alternative possibilities might be just a pre-scientific um, leftover from an earlier era, and, and, and the same goes for something like mental causation or causal control over our actions. Um, so the claim then is, <clears throat> if, if property P is required for free will, um, then there is just no such thing as um, free will. And I mean, there, there is uh, this, this kind of argument scheme certainly has a has has some force. Um, if you look at um, the picture of the world that um, you know certain fundamental physical theories give us, let's say quantum mechanics, it's not it's really not clear how you would locate intentional agency in quantum mechanics, or how you would locate mental causation in, in quantum mechanics. And you know something similar. Uh, can be said about other fundamental theories. Uh, even uh, when you think about um, uh, human um, b behavior um, and th the human organism just through the lens of physiology or neuroscience, it's not totally obvious where you'd locate these, um, uh, these uh, three different um, properties, in including intentional agency, at a purely neuroscientific uh, level of description. So what is my response? My response um, is that it may very well be true that there is no such thing as property P at the fundamental physical level, or even at the level of description employed by uh, neuroscience. But I claim that this observation doesn't show that there is no such thing as property P at all. Rather, free will and its prerequisites, so the various substitution instances for property P, whether it's intentionality, alternative possibilities, and causal control, I suggest that they are higher level phenomena. And I want to explain what exactly uh, this, this means to say that they are, they are higher level phenomena. Um, maybe just to get your uh, intuitions um, on board, think about a phenomenon such as um, unemployment or poverty. Uh, that's very much a real phenomenon. I, I don't think anyone can deny the reality of unemployment or, or, or poverty. Um, yet, if you were to study the world just through the perspective of, for instance, quantum mechanics, you would not see unemployment or, or poverty. I mean, you would see Schrodinger wave uh, functions and uh, you'd see the behavior of uh, uh, elementary particles, but you would certainly not see a phenomenon such as unemployment or, or, or poverty. Nonetheless, we wouldn't want to conclude that unemployment or poverty uh, don't exist or that they are not real. Rather, the, the, the right thing to conclude is that unemployment or poverty are um, higher level phenomena. They are phenomena that are properly located at the social level, not at the fundamental physical level. And my suggestion is it is a bit like this with free will too. So what I want to do in, um, in this lecture is um, uh, zoom in on one aspect of my defense of free will, and specifically I want to focus on the second of the three properties that I mentioned uh, that might be required for free will, 
namely alternative possibilities, so the, the ability to choose among different courses of action. And um, <clears throat> arguably that's the requirement for free will that has received by far the most attention in the philosophical literature on the topic. So a bearer of free will must at least in relevant situations be able to choose between different courses of action where each of them is a genuine possibility for that agent. Um, and unless agents at least sometimes have alternative possibilities, I'm going to assume free will would not get off the ground. Now I do admit that there is actually a very, um, you know, by now influential position within philosophy, compatibilism, um, which comes in different forms, but at least in, uh, under one prominent uh, version of compatibilism, um, the idea is to just give up on alternative possibilities as a requirement for free will. Maybe to say that free will just requires uh, intentionality or endorsement of one's actions, but it doesn't require uh, this idea that you know, the agent could have done um, otherwise. Um, that kind of view is quite prominent in philosophy. In fact, you know, many philosophers would describe themselves as, as compatibilists. Um, but I personally think that giving up uh, the um, requirement of alternative possibilities involves um, watering down the idea of uh, free will. And there is actually very strong evidence that um, if we look at um, uh, intuitions uh, among the general uh, population of people, you know, not restricted to people who've uh, studied philosophy and metaphysics in particular, then there are actually very, very strong libertarian intuitions uh, about free will, namely the intuition that free will really does require the possibility of doing otherwise. And moreover, there are studies that suggest that this intuition that um, we uh, have you know, genuine alternative possibilities is actually shared quite cross-culturally uh, as well. So this is not just tied to, let's say, a specific um, set of, uh, of you know, cultural assumptions, but in a variety of different uh, uh, countries with different cultural backgrounds, um, uh, people do express this uh, fundamental intuition that we have the ability to choose um, otherwise. Okay, so um, alternative possibilities require that there are sometimes forks in the road ahead of us. Um, we can choose between different futures depending on how we act. Um, now, once you start thinking about it like this, um, then there is actually something quite remarkable about this idea. Um, so let's suppose I make a choice between drinking a sip of water now or, or waiting a, a few minutes and then having a sip of water. So I make a choice between these, these two options. And the amazing thing is that the future will be ever so slightly different depending on how I choose. I mean, there is a sense in which uh, I thereby seem to be capable of putting the universe on a different trajectory. So, I, of course, the difference here is, is quite minor and it doesn't have much uh, of an effect on, on, on anything else. But, but, but still, uh, it, it looks as if, you know, I can either push the universe on uh, one course where this zip of water um, makes a particular physical movement now, or alternatively, I can put the universe on a different course where the zip of water um, you know, makes that movement a few minutes later. Now, if the world is deterministic, and I'll say more about this in a moment, <clears throat> then it seems that there could not be such forks in the road. Uh, insofar as determinism implies that given the initial state of the universe, only one course of events will have been physically possible under the laws of nature. In particular, if the universe um, is deterministic, then the initial state of the world, let's say at the time of the Big Bang, together with the laws of nature, would have been sufficient to predetermine all su subsequent events from the motion of the planets uh, to all human behavior. So, um, for instance, the fact that you are attending this lecture now um, in a deterministic scenario would be nothing but an inevitable consequence of the physical past. So even at the time of the Big Bang, um, the initial state of the universe would have been uh, such that um, a trajectory of the world in which you are going to show up uh, now for this lecture was inexorably necessitated. Um, and uh, in this sort of scenario, it looks as if you never had any genuine choices at all. I mean, choices that involve genuine forks in the road. So, I think it's clear what the challenge is. 
Um, so, first of all, um, I want to explain why we should take uh, determinism seriously. I mean, because one way to get out of this challenge would be to say, um, okay, well, maybe the universe or the, the, the world, the laws of nature just aren't deterministic, in which case this particular challenge doesn't arise. I, I should note that the other naturalistic challenges for free will, which I also mentioned, would still arise even in this scenario because we'd still have to defend the idea of intentional agency uh, and show that intentional agency is, is a real phenomenon and not just some kind of folk psychological illusion. And we would still have to demonstrate um, that there is mental causation, that we have genuine causal control over our actions. So the challenge would still be significant, um, but uh, those two other prongs of the challenge uh, you know, go beyond the scope of what I can cover in today's lecture, but you know, I have something to say on them as well. So if you want to bring them up in discussion, we, we, can, we can talk about them. But at any rate, if we were to concede that the world is, determ is indeterministic, the present challenge uh, wouldn't arise, so I need to say a bit more about why we should still take determinism seriously. Then I'll make some remarks about how we can interpret the idea of alternative possibilities, because there are different interpretations on offer. Uh, with uh, all this clarification in place, I'll make the challenge from determinism a little bit more precise, and I uh, revisit the nature of the challenge. And uh, then, in order to present my response, I'm going to draw a distinction between two different notions of determinism, which I'll call physical level determinism and agential level determinism. And uh, crucially, I'm hopefully I'll be able to convince you that uh, one does not imply the other, and uh, that turns out to be very significant for the free will debate. And then I'll conclude with a broader naturalistic perspective on how free will fits into a physical world. Okay, so why should we take determinism seriously? Well, as I already briefly noted, determinism is the thesis that at any given point in time, the present state of the world, perhaps together with all the past states, fully determines all future states of the world under the laws of nature. <clears throat> and indeterminism is simply the negation of that thesis. Uh, so at some points in time, two or more future sequence of states are each possible consistently with the same past history of states. That's exactly the idea of there being forks in the road. Now, our most fundamental scientific theories of macroscopic phenomena, broadly speaking, such as um, uh, Newton's classical mechanics and Einstein's special and general theories of relativity, uh, all describe the world as uh, deterministic. I mean, there's, there, there, there are some issues in the details, but broadly they give us a deterministic picture of the world. By contrast, some of our most fundamental theories of microscopic phenomena, most notably quantum mechanics, describe the world as indeterministic, at least under some standard interpretations. Um, so, in particular, the, the so-called uh, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, named after the, the place where its proponents uh, worked, uh, describes um, uh, uh, quantum processes as, as indeterministic processes. To give you an example, if you um, uh, if you shoot an individual light particle, an individual photon at a semi-transparent mirror, um, then, and then you install a very sensitive light detector to see whether the photon got uh, transmitted or reflected by the mirror, then um, you have a 50-50% chance of each of these two things happening. And under the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, that would uh, count as a truly indeterministic event. And that idea is actually even exploited in common technology. I think you can go to the internet and buy quantum random devices. These are basically machines that um, uh, you know, produce uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, you know, quantum, quantum indeterminacy so as to then generate random numbers out of it. And that kind of technology is relevant if, for instance, you run a betting website or betting shop uh, because you can then uh, you know, prove to your auditors uh, that uh, uh, you um, are not manipulating, but that you use a, a, a true uh, random process. I mean, whether this is truly random is, of course, contingent on the uh, quantum mechanics under the Copen interpretation being a broadly correct scientific theory, but that's at least a sort of uh, fairly widely held uh, mainstream view. 
Now, on the one hand, then, the fact that, according to fundamental physics, there are some apparently indeterministic phenomena, quantum phenomena, seems to suggest that the world cannot be deterministic. So that seems to be, on the one hand, sort of good enough for the claim that we, we don't have a deterministic world. Um, but on the other hand, <clears throat> determinism remains a viable thesis for at least two reasons. First of all, um, quantum indeterminacies are rarely amplified to a macroscopic level, or at any rate, it's uh, quite controversial whether and to what extent quantum indeterminacies really do get amplified uh, to the kind of macroscopic level at which they could make a genuine difference to um, larger scale systems, including biological organisms. I mean, one, uh, one key point uh, that has also been established in mainstream quantum mechanics is that uh, you can actually have what is called emergent classicality. So you can have classically behaved systems as emergent byproducts of underlying um, quantum systems. So even if there is uh, indeterminism at the quantum level, it's, uh, it's not at all clear that the kinds of macroscopic systems uh, that are exemplified in biological organisms um, really are in any way affected by um, quantum indeterminism. So that's, that's, that's one point. Um, and then secondly, uh, the status of quantum mechanics itself remains controversial. Um, and the Copenhagen interpretation that I gave you as an example, uh, while being perhaps the most prominent one, is only one amongst uh, several competing interpretations. And among other things, there are hidden variables interpretations of quantum mechanics uh, that um, would reconcile quantum mechanics with uh, underlying deterministic foundations. Um, uh, there are a variety of other, for instance, purely epistemic interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, a lot more could be said here, but um, the, the, the key point is that the, the final word uh, on uh, this issue uh, has not yet been spoken, and it is still very much an open scientific question whether a future unified theory of physics that reconciles quantum mechanics and the general theory of relativity is going to turn out uh, deterministic or, or indeterministic. So at this point, the idea of a deterministic universe uh, is very much a live uh, option, no less a live option than uh, the idea of an indeterministic universe. Okay, so that's why I think we should take determinism seriously. Um, now, um, how should we interpret the idea of alternative possibilities? I've been relatively um, informal about this so far. <clears throat> so we need to make this idea a bit more precise. Well, there are at least three kinds of interpretation of this idea on offer if we look at the philosophical literature. First of all, there is the traditional conditional interpretation of alternative possibilities. So on this interpretation, to say that someone could have done otherwise simply means that if this agent were to try or choose to do otherwise, he or she would have succeeded. Um, secondly, there is the so-called dispositional interpretation that received a lot of attention in the more recent philosophical literature. This says that um, uh, I can do otherwise if and only if I have the disposition to do otherwise when in appropriate circumstances I try to do otherwise. And um, th then exactly how we spell this out depends on what our theory of dispositions is. And you can substitute different theories of dispositions and you get subtly different uh, versions of, of this. Um, um, you know, making this precise is a little bit more complicated, but the dispositional interpretation is, in a sense, a slightly more sophisticated variant of the conditional interpretation. And then finally, there is the modal or possibilist interpretation. This, in, in many ways, is the sort of most literal interpretation of alternative possibilities. So in this interpretation, to say that um, an agent uh, is able to do otherwise is simply to say that it is possible in, in an appropriate sense for this agent to do otherwise. So which of these interpretations should we adopt? Well, the first thing I want to note is that if our only goal is to reconcile alternative possibilities with determinism, and we, and we, we don't care about anything else, then it looks like we should go for a conditional interpretation or maybe a dispositional interpretation and not the modal one. And let me explain why, why that is. So take the conditional interpretation. So even if the world was deterministic and, I was, and an agent was only ever going to do one thing rather than another, you know, from the time of the Big Bang onwards, 
it can still be true that in the nearest counterfactual world in which the agent tried to do otherwise, he or she would have succeeded. So, I mean, even if it was kind of written into the initial state of the universe that all of you were going to show up to this lecture today, it could still be true in the nearest counterfactual world, which is, you know, non-actual, where things have been a little bit different, different initial configurations of the universe, you, you would have done something else. That's sort of not so surprising. I mean, if the world had been a little bit different, you know, things would have gone differently. So the fact that determinism might have prevented that counterfactual world from becoming actual, given the initial state of the universe, that's irrelevant to the truth of the conditional claim. I mean, you can have a conditional where the antecedent was going to be um, false. Um, I mean, we can entertain all sorts of, uh, you know, counterfactual conditions. If I had spilled this water or if I had uh, toppled this water bottle five minutes ago, the water would have spilled on the ground. We want to say that's true, even though it may be that, you know, I was never ever going to um, topple the, the water bottle in the first place. So I think these considerations should illustrate that determinism doesn't really conflict with alternative possibilities under a conditional interpretation. And that's, an, and that's an, a long recognized point. G. E. Moore already in 1912 made essentially this point. Um, he wanted to interpret alternative possibilities in, these, in this conditional way. And so he said, our theory does not assert that any agent ever could have chosen any other action than, what, than the one he actually performed, it only asserts that he could have acted differently if he had chosen, not that he could have made that choice. So the claim is the agent uh, you know, could have done something else if he or she had chosen something else, but the claim was not that you know, he or she could ever have made that, that choice. Okay, so I think so far, it should be clear that if you interpret alternative possibilities in these conditional terms, you don't get a conflict with determinism. And something similar could be said about the dispositional interpretation as well. That's just a little bit more elaborate. But again, alternative possibilities under the dispositional interpretation also do not conflict with determinism. But I'll, I'll set that aside. So what about the modal interpretation? Well, I think it's clear that this should make it much harder to reconcile free will with determinism. So if alternative possibilities require quite literally that it should be possible for the agent to do otherwise, then it's just not obvious how you could have alternative possibilities in a deterministic world. I mean, that's the point that I made at the beginning of the lecture. If determinism means that you know, there is only one possible trajectory that the world could have taken from the time of the Big Bang onwards, then, you know, how could there be these forks in the road? So, as I said, under determinism at any given point in time, there's never more than one possible future sequence of events given the state of the universe at that time. So, at first sight, it looks like if you want to determine, if you want to defend alternative possibilities, in a deterministic world, the modal interpretation is just a total non-starter. Nonetheless, what I want to suggest and want to show is that we should adopt the modal interpretation and this can be reconciled with determinism. So I'm setting a relatively tough bar for the moment. So why should we go for the modal interpretation of alternative possibilities? Well, the main reason is that uh, any of these other interpretations would just water down the, the idea of alternative possibilities um, far too much. Um, so let me just illustrate this. Let's suppose someone made a fateful decision. For instance, they committed a crime. Jones killed Smith, let's say. Um, so when we say that Jones could have acted otherwise, we don't merely want to say that Jones could have acted otherwise if the world had been a little bit different. Um, rather, we want to say that even under conditions as they actually were, it was possible for this person to have acted otherwise. Um, I mean, it's, 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 no, it's, it's not really enough to say, well, if, if the universe had been a slightly different one, different initial conditions and so on, then Jones would not have committed the crime. That's, that's true, but it's kind of unsurprising. We'd want to say that even in the conditions as they actually were, Jones could have refrained from committing the crime. And it's because we, want, because we are, prepared, are prepared to say that, that we consider Jones responsible for the murder. 
So Susan Hurley summarizes this point quite nicely. She says, the ability to do otherwise entails the outright possibility of acting otherwise. It entails that there is a causal possibility of acting otherwise holding all else constant. A counterfactually conditioned disposition to act otherwise, if the world had been a little bit different, is not the same as an outright possibility of acting otherwise. That the former, the, the you know, conditional, counterfactually conditioned disposition, that that is compatible with determinism, doesn't entail that the latter, the outright possibility is. And ultimately, if we really want to show that there are, there are alternative possibilities, we need to show that there are alternative possibilities in this much more literal sense, genuine forks in the road. Okay, so let's now revisit the challenge from determinism. Mm -hmm. So with this clarification of the idea of alternative possibilities in place, um, we can look again at the challenge from determinism. <clears throat> and I'll now formulate the challenge in the form of a little syllogism. Premise one, free will requires that at the time of interest, more than one alternative course of action is possible for the agent. Premise two, determinism implies that at the time of interest, only one alternative course of action is possible for the agent. Conclusion, free will and determinism are incompatible. Okay, so that's a perfectly fine argument. I, I think this argument is, is, is clearly valid. I mean, I've written it down in, uh, in, in words a little bit informally, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure you could translate it into uh, into formal logic, and uh, it would, uh, uh, you know, work perfectly well as a uh, as a nice example of a, of a valid argument. Furthermore, as I already um, uh, suggested, I want to take the first premise to be completely non-negotiable. Um, free will requires alternative possibilities, and so the only way to resist the conclusion then, if indeed we want to resist the conclusion, is to give up the second premise of the argument. So let's take a closer look at the second premise. Um, here it is again. Determinism implies that at the time of interest, only one alternative course of action is possible for the agent. And remember that uh, I'm, I, I really mean possible here, so we set aside all these other uh, you know, conditional uh, or dispositional notions of alternative possibilities. Now, at first sight, this looks like a totally correct statement of what determinism implies. Uh, informally, we would even interpret determinism as this claim that there are no forks in the road. <clears throat> but strictly speaking, this particular wording of the second premise is actually not quite right. And I want to draw your attention to the reference to possibility for the agent, which I've underlined here. Now, determinism in its standard form is a thesis about physical possibilities, not about possibilities for the agent. So, if we're just strict and pedantic, the following wording would be more accurate. Let's call this premise two star. Determinism implies that at any given time, only one future sequence of events is physically possible, given the physical state of the universe. I mean, that isn't, again, it's a little bit imprecise. We can write this down with, with with full precision, but if you take the definition of determinism that um, you would find in a uh, physics textbook introducing classical dynamical systems, then I mean you would find something like uh, premise two star as your definition of determinism. Okay, so now let's replace this slightly precisified version of the premise with the original one. And so here's what the revised argument would look like after this uh, substitution. Premise one, as before, says free will requires that at the time of interest, more than one course of action is possible for the agent. Premise two star says determinism implies that at any given time, only one future sequence of events is physically possible. Conclusion, free will and determinism are incompatible. Now, is this argument still valid? Um, and you will already have noticed that there are two different senses of possibility now uh, in, this, in this argument. Uh, the first premise refers to possibility for the agent. The second premise refers to physical possibilities. And um, it's obvious that unless those two notions of possibility are either identical or at least related to one another in the right kind of way, we no longer have a valid argument. <clears throat> and so here's a simple observation. Our conclusion the incompatibility of free will and determinism, that conclusion 
follows from these two premises only if the reworded premise 2 star, the one that refers to physical possibility, implies the earlier premise 2, the one that refers to agential possibility. So whether the argument is valid then hinges on whether the reworded premise 2 star implies the earlier premise 2. And this relationship that we would need to make this a valid argument would hold if the following thing were true. I'll just call this the linking thesis for obvious reasons. If at any given time only one future sequence of events is physically possible, then at that time only one alternative course of action is possible for the agent. So if that sort of claim is true, then you can add it to your argument here and you know, once again we've got a valid argument. I think so far this should all be uh, fairly uh, transparent and, and straightforward. Um, and at first sight, of course, this linking thesis sounds perfectly reasonable. I mean, if at any given time there is only one possible, physically possible future sequence of events, then it looks as if at that time only one alternative course of action should be possible for, for each agent. So at first sight, this looks unproblematic. Nonetheless, what I want to show is that this linking thesis is false despite uh, its uh, initial plausibility. And the falsity of this linking thesis becomes evident, um, I think, once we distinguish between two conceptually different forms of determinism. And so that takes us to um, what I already announced, the distinction between physical level and agential level determinism. So here are the two notions. Physical level determinism, that's what um, I already discussed uh, several times uh, in this lecture. It, that's the thesis that at any given time, given the full physical state of the universe at that time, only one future sequence of events is physically possible. Agential level determinism is the thesis that at any time, given the psychological or agential state of a particular agent, only one particular course of action is possible for that agent. And so I want to make a twofold claim. First of all, my claim is that free will would be threatened only by agential level determinism, not by physical level determinism. And secondly, even if the world is deterministic at, the, at a physical level, there is still room for indeterminism at an agential level as an emergent phenomenon. Now, I think that free will is threatened by agential level determinism should be fairly uncontroversial. I mean, if at any given time, my psychological or agential state uh, renders only one course of action uh, possible, uh, then, well, I clearly do not have alternative possibilities. So certainly agential level determinism conflicts with free will. But I want to show you that um, physical level determinism does not uh, imply agential level determinism. In fact, my claim, I'll look at only part of the claim here, my, my claim is actually even stronger. My claim is that physical level indeterminism is neither necessary nor even sufficient for agential level indeterminism. So let me now elaborate a little bit. So when we are asking whether a particular action is possible for an agent, the appropriate level of description is not the one given by fundamental physics, for instance, by quantum mechanics, let's say, or by uh, you know, Einstein's special or general theory of relativity or whatever your preferred theory would be, um, but rather the appropriate level of description is the one given by our best theory of human agency or psychology. So the description of the world that matters here is not a microscopic physical description, but a what I call a macroscopic psychological description. And crucially then, our best psychological theories, I argue, do not entail agential level determinism in, insofar as they do not model human psychology as a deterministic uh, system. I can say a lot more about this as we um, go along. So let me sketch my argument against agential level determinism. So descriptions of the world at the psychological or agential level are more coarse-grained than physical descriptions. And this phenomenon is actually um, often described as multiple realizability. There are many different physical states that um, can realize the same agential or psychological uh, state. Uh, so uh, to, to give a very simple example, um, 
you know, my my belief that uh, I'm in Turin at the moment, uh, it's a psychological property, um, that can be realized uh, by an inordinate number of subtly different configurations of my uh, brain. So whether, let's say, a particular particle in my brain is spin up or spin down is uh, is presumably completely irrelevant to this uh, to the psychological state, and um, when we um, describe uh, uh, an agent at the psychological level, we deliberately abstract away from certain microphysical or microscopic details of the uh, particular neural realization. Um, that's an, a certain amount of information loss, but it's actually a gain from the perspective of picking up the patterns and regularities that, that truly uh, matter. And that's a very standard move. Whenever we move from fundamental physics to any of the more special sciences, we abstract away from certain details in order to pick up uh, other salient regularities that we are genuinely interested in. So you don't need to describe the state of every elementary particle in the brain, for instance, to specify an agential state at the level of detail required for psychology. In fact, such fine-grained microphysical descriptions would be totally unhelpful for psychology. You wouldn't see the forest for all the trees if you opted for, for them. And conceptually, microphysical descriptions are not even part of the language of um, psychology. Um, you know, psych psychology uses totally different concepts and categories. Uh, using the concepts and categories of psychology, you wouldn't describe uh, the microphysical state of the brain, but conversely, using the concepts and categories of brain science, you wouldn't necessarily describe certain you know, higher level intentional states um, either. A key implication of this point about multiple realizability of psychological states at the physical level is that the same agential state can be consistent with several distinct physical states, and that in turn, I'll now show you, is, means that there can be indeterminism at the agential level, even when there is determinism at the underlying physical level. And now I'll give you a little toy model to um, uh, hopefully uh, make my point uh, more vivid. Um, so here we are thinking of the world as a simple dynamical system, at any given time, the system is in a particular state, and then this state uh, evolves over time according to the laws governing the system. And uh, what I've displayed here is, is just a very simple illustration of such a dynamical system where the dots uh, up here um, uh, represent uh, states that the system can be in at a particular point in time, and then the lines uh, represent uh, trajectories or histories of the system uh, across time. Um, you see whether I have a, no, I don't have a laser pointer, but I don't, I don't think I, I, I need one, so it should be pretty, yeah, no, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to, to yeah, I, I don't have a pointer, but I mean, you can obviously see that if we start with this state at time one, there ah, there is one, okay. Oh, fantastic. Ah, here, okay. Yeah, if we start with this state at time one, uh, then we're going to move to that state at time two, that state at time three, that state at time four, or if we begin with this state at time one, we're going to move here at time two, time three, time four, and, and so on. Okay, so it's very uh, clear how we would read um, this, this sort of diagram. Now, um, in this uh, system, the uh, histories that I have displayed are all deterministic in the sense that once you fix the state of the system at time one, you have uh, thereby um, predetermined all the subsequent states because let's say starting here, for instance, you're guaranteed under the laws of the system to move to that state, to that state, and so on. You can never get from this state, for instance, uh, to a state uh, over, over here. Um, there is no branching in any of these histories. So that's a simple illustration of a, um, a system with um, deterministic uh, physical histories. Okay, so far so good. I think I've still got everyone on board, good. Um, now, let's assume that um, these um, little dots represent microphysical states of the system, um, and let's assume uh, that, as I, as I already indicated, 
uh, different microphysical states can um, realize the same higher level agential state uh, in line with this assumption of multiple realizability of the agential uh, states at the uh, physical level. And so specifically, just for the purposes of this toy model, we're going to assume that whenever um, a different physical states here are in the same box within this rectangular grid, then they are different possible physical realizers of the same agential state. So for instance, um, these uh, physical states here would all be different realizers of the same agential state. These physical real states here would all be uh, instances of the same agential state um, and, and, and so on. Um, so, the, so the idea is agential states correspond to an entire equivalence class of physical states, um, uh, which are physically different but uh, uh, indistinguishable uh, as far as agential or psychological properties are concerned. Okay, so now um, what happens if we focus on the uh, agential states alone we abstract away from the physical states and just um, re-describe the system at the agential level. And so here's what we get. Um, I've now um, uh, produced these thick dots to represent um, agential states. Um, and uh, we've got a function from physical states to agential states. We can interpret this in philosophical jargon as a supervenience uh, relation that tells us exactly which agential state each physical state corresponds to. And then we're just looking at what the original histories um, look like under this um, supervenience relation that takes us from the original physical states uh, to the resulting agential states. Um, and um, what I've displayed here is basically the agential histories um, uh, described in this more abstract coarse-grained uh, way that result uh, from the original physical histories, but once we set aside uh, the um, microphysical detail, and you can see immediately that those agential histories uh, are indeterministic histories in the very same uh, sense that we defined indeterminism um, earlier, albeit uh, uh, indeterministic at the agential level. So now given, um, for instance, um, this agential state at time one, um, you could get from this agential state to either that agential state or to this agential state. And from this agential state at time three, you can get either to this agential state or to, the, to that agential state. So clearly those agential histories um, qualify as um, indeterministic. So what we can see here is that indeterminism in agential histories can result as an emergent byproduct from determinism in physical histories um, when the relationship between physical and agential state is characterized by multiple realizability. So the bottom line then is that physical level determinism is compatible with agential level indeterminism as this example shows. We've got physical level determinism and consistently with that agential level indeterminism. Agential level indeterminism can be an emergent uh, phenomenon, and that suggests that physical level determinism alone doesn't challenge um, free will. Um, if indeed we require only agential level indeterminism for free will, um, then insofar as this can happily coexist with physical level determinism, we've basically blocked the linking thesis that I introduced earlier that would be required to uh, get our argument uh, for the incompatibility of free will and physical level determinism. And in fact, the observations that I've illustrated here with the help of this simple toy model are in line with a broader point, which is that um, whether a system is deterministic or not may actually depend on the level of description. So it's worth just saying a few things about this, this broader point. So generally, when we think about some system, um, you know, this could be the world in its entirety, it could be a particular physical system, it could be the weather system, the climate system, the economy, you know, any system that you might want to study. When we think about a particular system, it's not particularly meaningful 
to ask, is this system deterministic simpliciter, or is this system indeterministic simpliciter? Rather, to, have a, to ask a meaningful question, we need to be very clear and precise about the level of description at which we are uh, uh, talking about this system. And once we specify the level of description, then it becomes a meaningful question to ask whether that system is a deterministic or indeterministic system. So it might very well be that when you think of the Earth's atmosphere as a microphysical system described by, um, by you know, classical microphysics, then it is a deterministic system. But when you think of it as a, um, uh, as a um, uh, statistical mechanical system or as a thermodynamic system, then you would think of the very same system, now you know, redescribed in a more coarse-grained way, as an indeterministic system. And relative to each level of description, it is a, an entirely meaningful and you know, scientifically precise question whether a system is deterministic or indeterministic. But nonetheless, the, the, the very distinction between determinism and indeterminism depends on the level of description. Okay. Um, so, so far I've, I've blocked this argument for the incompatibility of free will and physical level determinism. So now to just sort of round this off, I'll conclude with some broader remarks about the resulting naturalistic perspective on, on free will. So my claim has been that we should analyze what an agent can or cannot do in terms of agential rather than physical possibility. Now some people, I'm sure some in the room, will object that I've just identified an epistemic sense in which relative to the informational limitations of the special sciences like psychology, theory of agency, as opposed to physics, we cannot predict which course of action an agent will take. But that doesn't establish that an agent truly has alternative possibilities. I mean, you might say, sure, there is perhaps unpredictability about what someone will do because we don't know the full microphysical state, but that's not good enough for establishing that there truly is a gentle level in determinism, that there are true alternative possibilities. It's just unpredictability and maybe the illusion of alternative possibilities relative to certain informational limitations. Now, what can be said in response to this objection? Well, my claim is that the psychological as opposed to the physical level is the right and only level for thinking about intentional agency and what agents can and cannot do. I mean, recall that um, in quantum mechanics, for instance, or in, cl in, in classical mechanics, uh, there is no, no such thing as intentional agency at all. Intentionality is not a physical concept. Um, I mean, if you were to look at the um, world solely through the level of fundamental physics, you, the entire discussion of free will wouldn't get off the ground. We wouldn't even get to the point where, where we are now in the discussion because we wouldn't even be able to talk about agents in the first place. We'd be able to talk about certain biophysical systems perhaps, but not intentional agents. Um, and so insofar as free will is a feature of intentional agents, we can only meaningfully analyze free will in a way that uh, is appropriate to the study and discussion and analysis of intentional agency. And that is clearly the psychological level of description and not the fundamental physical one. So therefore, I'm insisting that by choosing the psychological or agential level of description, we've chosen exactly the right level of description for thinking about free will. And then it's no surprise that for thinking about the notion of possibility, we should also employ the notion of possibility that is appropriate for that level of description, rather than import a notion of physical possibility that comes from an altogether different level of description. And in addition, my claim is that you know, once we actually recognize that the psychological level is the right level of description for thinking about free will, then at that level, uh, free will is indeed a real phenomenon no less real than other higher level phenomena like beliefs, desires, intentions, and so on. I mean, interestingly, you find tons of arguments to the effect that free will is an illusion um, or that uh, there, yeah, there is no such thing as, as free will. You find far fewer arguments to the effect that um, beliefs are an illusion. You do find some such arguments, perhaps, but you'll find even fewer arguments to the effect that, let's say, 
unemployment, poverty, economic growth, um, the existence of social institutions, that, that that is an illusion. I think very few people would uh, claim that, that those phenomena are illusions, uh, even though they are higher level phenomena. Somehow it is widely recognized that higher level descriptions are appropriate for studying those phenomena, but, but somehow in, in the discussion of free will, the absence of the relevant properties, what I called property P earlier on, at the fundamental physical level is often taken to, to, to challenge uh, uh, free will. And I think there is actually something um, has, has gone wrong with, with those um, arguments. Um, so my, my claim that um, once we adopt the appropriate psychological level of description, we should now be realists about intentional agency as well as free will that response rests on a particular attitude towards ontological questions, so questions about what exists or what phenomena, properties, or things are, are real. And that's broadly the naturalistic ontological attitude. Um, uh, it goes back at, at least to uh, Quine's philosophy, but uh, it's quite, uh, I think, common in philosophy of science circles. Um, and this can be made a lot more precise, but a very rough gloss is that our best guide to ontological questions in any given domain is given by our best scientific theories of that domain, at least in the absence of defeating considerations. So for instance, if we want to figure out whether the Higgs boson or whether leptons uh, or quarks or whatever are truly real, what do we do? Well, we consult our best theories of particle physics and um, if uh, those theories support the existence of those entities and if there are no other defeating considerations that would somehow undermine those, those theories and reduce their credibility, then we adopt a kind of tentative realist attitude towards those entities. Of course, with a good scientific spirit that you know, once in a while um, there might be new evidence that might lead us to revisit our ontology, but the claim here is you know, we have no better guide to ontological questions than our best uh, science. And my claim, which I can here only state, but I defend in much more detail elsewhere, especially in my um, uh, forthcoming free will book, is that free will in the technical sense of an agent having a choice between more than one course of action in many situations is a key presupposition of our best scientific and not just folk theories of agency, at least when we understand these theories uh, literally. Very briefly, um, I claim that, basically I make two claims. Um, the first claim is that um, intentional agency is not at all just a folk notion which is a leftover from a pre-scientific age. Rather, we would have to completely categorically give up on uh, the existing practice of the social sciences if we were to give up uh, the idea that uh, humans are intentional agents. So I, my claim is that actually uh, intentional explanations explaining people, social phenomena, behavioral phenomena, in terms of the description of agency, that is absolutely indispensable for um, the human social and behavioral sciences. And so that, that alone gives us very good naturalistic grounds for taking intentional agency um, seriously and being realists about that phenomenon. And then in the second step, my claim is that um, once you take intentional agency seriously as, as a real phenomenon and you explain um, uh, human behavior in intentional terms, then that actually carries a certain commitment to free will, at least once you understand um, uh, in theories of intentional agency literally. Because for instance, the idea of agents having options uh, between which they choose and distinguishing between which options are possible or feasible for an agent and which options then are rational or intentionally supported by an agent. That kind of distinction is absolutely central to the logic of intentional explanation. And were we to deny the idea of um, non-singleton option sets, the logic of intentional explanation would, would break down. But I understand that here I've only sketched that, that argument uh, very, very roughly and haven't given you all the details to, to fully convince you of that point. So these considerations, together with the observation that the original argument for the incompatibility of free will and physical determinism fails, should lead us to take free will seriously. So to wrap up, at first sight, you might think that my view is a little bit counterintuitive, but, and 
many audiences have protested against it, so you'd be the first audience to be convinced. So, well, let's see. Um, but at first sight, um, I think uh, my view actually has common sense on its side. So let's imagine an article in next week's issue of Nature or Science that reports a big breakthrough in physics, including the finding that the universe is deterministic. And let's suppose that uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not just one of those articles which are then you know, mega controversial and uh, half of the scientific community thinks it's crazy, but, but let's suppose that this is really, really, really compelling and um, uh, you know, everyone who studies this carefully and seriously comes to the conclusion we've really nailed the grand unified theory of physics and the news is the universe is truly governed by deterministic laws of nature. The possibility that this could happen, it could happen, we, we, we really do not know, fundamental physics remains in flux, it could happen during our lifetimes. And nobody knows when, but no, all of a sudden that kind of article could appear. How should we react to this news? Should we conclude that it challenges our understanding of the human condition as profoundly as the discovery of evolutionary theory did in the 19th century? I mean, remember in the 19th century, um, when evolutionary theory first appeared, um, in the eyes of many people, it challenged the understanding of the human position in the universe absolutely profoundly, because until then, there was a very strong belief in human exceptionalism, uh, and evolutionary theory challenged this idea and uh, gave a, a totally different perspective on how human beings fit into the rest of the natural world. And that, uh, in the eyes of many, was a major shock to the system. And uh, you know, up to this date, you've got um, a number of people who, for religious, cultural, or whatever other reasons, uh, uh, deny uh, evolutionary theory, though, by and large, um, the mainstream now embraces uh, evolutionary theory. You might say that the finding that the universe is deterministic could be an even bigger challenge to the understanding of um, uh, the human position in, in the world insofar as if, if we really thought that this takes free will and uh, a, you know, genuine uh, intentional uh, decision-making capacities uh, away from us, because we take that to be a really crucial feature of uh, ourselves as, as agents. Should we then stop deliberating about what to do and holding one another accountable for our actions? I mean, as Immanuel Kant already observed, when we deliberate about what to do, we have to assume ourselves to be free. It's a presupposition of deliberation. It'd be very, very difficult to deliberate about what to do if you did not during this deliberative process, entertain the assumption or presupposition that the different options are really open to you. Um, um, should we release all murders, murderers from prison on grounds that um, there was no responsibility in the first place? Or alternatively, should we just go on with our everyday business thinking that this new discovery is just an interesting and exciting development in physics with you know, tons of popular science stories to be written about it, we study it at university and then we move on. Now I think giving up our conventional understanding of free will and revising the fabric of how human society works would be an overreaction. Um, and what I think I've shown that is that a relatively mild revision of our technical vocabulary, namely the shift from physical to agential possibility in the analysis of free will, is actually enough to rehabilitate practically everything we conventionally think and say about free will, even against the background of physical determinism. And so I suggest, therefore, that the best way to defend the compatibility of free will and determinism is by recognizing that free will is not a fundamental physical phenomenon, but a higher level phenomenon that is on a par with other higher level phenomena, like beliefs, desires, intentions, and indeed agency itself. Um, so if we are searching for free will at the level of fundamental physics, we are simply searching in the wrong place. Thank you.